Welcome to the Progressive Women's Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Brown, and my guest today on the show is Christy Arbogast. Christy is currently the co-scientific director of the Center for Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Christy has a PhD in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania and is a research associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Most recently, Christy's focus has been around increasing the safety of our children, specifically around the topic of concussions. The demand for her research brings her all over the world as she has recently presented in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Indianapolis, Sweden, Germany, and Japan. Welcome, Christy. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. What an amazing background, traveling all over the place. Sounds like fun. I've seen parts of the world that I never thought I would um, as a byproduct of the, the work I do and the collaborations that I've been able to establish. So co-scientific director at the Center of Injury Research and Prevention at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Sounds awesome. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what the responsibilities there are? Sure. Um, the Injury Center here at CHOP is one of 10 research centers of emphasis for the hospital. And so we have a team of about 30 to 40 individuals from a variety of different disciplines. As you mentioned, I'm an engineer by training. We have a a group of engineers. We have psychologists, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, as well as clinicians, all focused on the issue of child injury. And so my role along with Laura Winston, um, the director, is to really set the strategic direction of the center, what are the research areas we want to focus on, and then um, mentor uh, uh, our team to achieve uh, our mission in those areas. I mean, a very meaningful goal. Sounds like a lot of exciting work that's being done there. Let's take it back to the beginning, and then we can bring it back up to where we are today. So you started out in the bioengineering, and what was that like back then? Talk to a little bit about that, and a little bit as a woman, what it was like in that environment. So I did my undergraduate work at Duke University, and I I was good in math and science, and so engineering was always something that was kind of put out there as something that I should be interested in. And I think when I went to Duke as an undergrad, I still um, maintained an interest in going to medical school, actually. And and someone had told me that uh, having an engineering degree was uh, an easier way to get into medical school. So that sounded good to me. Um, And then it was really my sophomore year when I had a biomechanics class and figured out I actually really liked the engineering. And, And I think of the engineering disciplines... Uh, bioengineering is probably more female than the other ones. I would say at Duke, my classes were maybe um, 30, 70 or 40, 60 female, male. Um, And then when I came to Penn for my graduate degree, that was probably about the same. So through my training, I, I don't think I ever felt that being a woman in engineering was unusual, but I will say as I've moved on to my career and moved up in leadership positions and responsibility, you know, there's, there's many instances where I'm the only female in the room. I mean, you hear stereotypes today where, you know, a lot of, um, I mean, we both have daughters, we've heard it in circles that I'm a girl, I'm not good in math. You seem to have the opposite. You've also raised a daughter. When you hear that, how do you respond to something like that? I think it's about the, the opportunities that, that those young people are given and the, the paths that they can see themselves taking. I think part of the you know, lower percentage of young women that go into math and science careers is partially that they're they're 
told they're not good in it, but also that I don't think they see career paths in it that are um, appropriate, quote unquote, for women or natural for women. And so I think both of those things are at work that lead to young women choosing other paths. Though I do think that's, that is changing. You know, there's tremendous programs sponsored by private foundations, sponsored by the federal government to really integrate young women, even at like elementary and middle school, to see those paths of what could I do when I grow up if I stayed in math and science as a female. I agree. Things have changed a lot there. So then you, you're moving through your career and you know, you've gotten to school and you talked a little bit about being in meetings where you would be the only woman in those meetings. Now, at some level, some people can see that as intimidating. Some people can see it as encouraging. How are you seeing it early on? From my perspective, I chose to view it as an asset. Um, how it played out practically is that everyone knew who I was. I was the girl. And I wasn't, you know, they knew my name, they knew where I was from because I, that, you know, one of these things is not like the other. Rather than having to, you know, early in your career kind of fight for identity among a sea of similar looking, not just in appearance, but also in kind of, um, you know, background and capability amongst a group of men. So I, I've actually viewed it as an asset. I've had, I've never been in a situation where I felt um, slighted as a woman professionally. And so I, I just choose to kind of embrace it. I, I'm the female in the room. Um, and it, it, I think it has worked well because people tend to remember me. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective. So you see it as, not seeing it as something intimidating, seeing it as a differentiator, seeing it as a way that to be noticed, seeing it as a way that people can understand who you are and know who you are. Correct. Now, when you were in that situation, were you seeing other women in the workplace that were modeling it? Were you blazing a path on your own? How would you have described it? I, I, I've really been fortunate to have several excellent female mentors in my career. My PhD advisor, uh, Dr. Susan Margulies, who's, who's still here at Penn, just the fact that I had a female PhD advisor in bioengineering um, when when I was going through school, she was having her children, and and so it, it really provided a a very clear, tangible model of how you could do this. And then once I graduated with my PhD and started working at CHOP, our center director now now my my colleague. Dr. Flora Winston also provided another female role model to, to really show to me that this was normal and possible and, and there was nothing out of the ordinary. So I was really fortunate both in my graduate training and then, you know, beginning from day one here at CHOP to have good female role models that I didn't feel I was as you said, blazing a trail. I had others to, to model after. Now, you know, looking back on it and the way you're expressing it, it seemed like it naturally fell into place. What we hear a lot of times is some folks don't know exactly, how, some women don't know exactly how to approach others to be a mentor, others to, it seems like, you know, the way that the story is being told, there was someone there, you connected with them. What if people are not connecting as easily? Would you get, what kind of guidance would you give them? There's been a, a lot of focus in academic medicine on mentorship. And so there's a very rich um, mentorship emphasis here at CHOP. And I've been involved both as the mentee and now kind of later in my career as the mentor. And, and so the advice I got and the advice I give is – Mentor can mean a variety of different things from very formal that, you know, someone does a performance review of your, your progress versus someone 
that you meet for coffee twice a year to bounce ideas off of. And, and the advice I've always given is I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would say no to the coffee twice a year option. And so if you see someone as a young person or just if you're seeking mentorship, that you like how they carry themselves, you like how they conduct themselves in meetings, you're, you're interested in their research, ask them to coffee. That, that's harmless. It's not asking for some long-term commitment that maybe they're reluctant to get into, but a cup of coffee it may turn into something much more formal and, and more involved, but it may just be coffee. Yeah, that's very good guidance. Not everyone needs to sign like a mentoring contract and that you're, you know, <laughs> you're committed to like be my person for now till eternity. So then you were able to have these mentors. Can you talk a little bit about, so there was a value that they provided to you that was that they were role modeling and you saw what they were doing. Was there other things that they were doing for you? So I'm trying to paint a picture of what people can expect in that mentoring relationship when it's, you know, it sounds like you have very good ones. What does that look like? What is, what, you know, you were saying could, there's a blend between the formal and the presentation, you know, performance review and getting the cup of coffee. But if you can paint a picture of what that solid mentoring relationship looks like and what you were getting out of it. I think the biggest uh, contribution that I got from my mentors early on and still go to them for is priority setting. I think that folks are presented with, you know, a diversity of opportunities throughout their career. And, you know, all of us, I think, are faced with, you know, either being overwhelmed or having an exceedingly full plate when some fabulous opportunity comes along. And so probably the biggest role that I've asked of my mentors is helping me make those value judgments of, is this something that I should participate in? And, you know, what's the consequence short term and long term for me passing on this particular opportunity? And I have found that the other kind of aspect of mentoring is a have lots of them so that you get you know a diverse opinion and make sure you have ones that are both kind of within your discipline and kind of in your everyday as well as those that are outside your discipline when I got my faculty position at Penn and and CHOP, I was in the division of emergency medicine. Now I'm not a a clinician and the division chief is an emergency medicine um, physician. And she and I, again, I've I've really lucked out. I've always had excellent women mentors. She and I used to joke that she has no idea what my scientific world is about. She's not an engineer, but she could help me make those value judgments with kind of being one step removed from being in the weeds, but understanding what a person at my um, step in my career should be focusing on. So I I think that's the biggest value I've derived from this kind of group of mentors that that I've been able to interact with. So let's go back to you were talking about you you had gotten out of, of school and you started to work. And you start to be in meetings where you were the only woman in those meetings and you were starting to make a name for yourself. And, you know, as uh, we talked about before we started, you have this impressive resume of, you know, 28 pages of different things that you've done. And you've made, you've jumped and you've done things that have progressed your career. I th- when we talk to someone like yourself, one of the things we like to learn is, what were some of the things that helped you jump? There's, you look back in your career and there were certain things that you had did. It's like, wow, that one thing helped me get to where I wanted to be. Do you have one or two of those you can share? Yes. I think the, the first thing is that I've always been able to do what I like. And, and that, that is one of the freedoms of being in academia is is 
we have a little more freedom to to explore the things we like doing. And, and so I think by being able to focus on what I like, I've been able to kind of make pivots and jumps in response to my own interests. And so if you're interested in what you're doing, I think you have a greater likelihood of being successful at it. So, yes. so the, the freedom that I have in an academic setting, I think, has allowed me to make those maneuvers in my career. And then a more specific example has to do with how I got into probably for the first 10 to 12 years of my career here at CHOP, I was almost exclusively focused on automobile safety. So how to keep kids safe in car crashes, design of airbags, seatbelts, child restraints, that sort of thing. There were two opportunities that were presented to me that shifted my career to concussion such that now at least 50% and maybe more of my time is spent in the concussion field. And those two opportunities were, first, a, an opportunity to sit on a National Institute of Medicine panel on uh, sports concussion in youth. It was a tremendous professional opportunity, took an extraordinary amount of time that I didn't have, but was one of those things where I called my mentors and said, hey, I just got this call to sit on this big committee. It's going to take a lot of my time and distract me from some of the other things I have on my plate. Should I do it? And almost, you know, unanimously, they're like, absolutely. That that was one of those experiences that allowed me to establish myself as a thought leader in this field. And that has just continued to kind of open doors and opportunities. And then about at the same time, there was an internal funding opportunity within CHOP to get some resources to do some patient safety initiatives. And again, I'm not a clinician. And so originally I didn't think that that was like an opportunity that I should even pay attention to. But as my kids were getting more involved with sports and I became more interested in understanding prevention, diagnosis, and management of sports-related concussion, and talking with some of our clinicians here, I saw that funding opportunity as a way to begin my initiatives in, in research and, and programmatic activities in concussion and went for it. You know, you know, this was a funding opportunity that was designed primarily for clinicians, but that wasn't the rules. You know, there was no part of the RFA that said you must be a clinician to apply for it. And so I, along with my sports medicine colleague, Dr. Tina Master, I was able to put forth a coherent proposal to get that part of our research and programmatic activities off the ground. And so the combination of those two opportunities, both of which, you know, if you had looked at my plate at the time, I couldn't handle either of them. But they were, <laughs> they were critical to allowing me to pivot to something that I'm very passionate about, very interested in, and have allowed me to have the foundation to open other doors and, and take advantage of other opportunities. There's some great messages in there. I mean, focusing on, I mean, the first part, focusing on the back to your mentors and how important that part of it is that they were supportive, that they understood where the opportunity was, and also focusing on the things that you're passionate about. When we focus on things we're passionate about, good things will happen. And I do. that was a, that was a great example of it. And it fit well. It's another thing that you you know, you keep saying that you I was lucky for this, I was lucky for that, but you focus on the things and you're pushing for those things. It was something related to your children and you were able to tie those two together and made you even more passionate about it, I'm sure had an influence on your success there. It did. I mean, I think any of us that are working parents kind of struggle with that balance. You know, that's not limited to moms. I know you and I have shared comments about how that applies to dads as well. 
And so where I feel that I, I have been fortunate is the work that I've done, both in auto safety and in concussion, has direct application to my children's lives. And so I'm, I'm able to see how the work I'm doing is affecting them their, and their peers, and that is very fulfilling and, you know, in some way helps me justify or rationalize. I don't know what the word is there, but being away from them, having a career that, you know, forces me to miss some things that I, I, would, I would not choose to miss, but that's just how it shakes out. Uh, but because it's been something that's directly applicable to their lives and that they have shown interest in, I think it has helped uh, in that work-life balance. Yeah, I'd like to go a little deeper in that work-life balance, but I'd like to go back in time a little bit. I know where you are today in the cycle. You have a, a high schooler and one in college, but back when they were much younger and you were working to balance those types, if Talking to some of the, the women in the audience, if when they're struggling with those types of issues, you know, talking much younger ages, you know, children under the age of 10 and trying to balance those types of things, can you talk a little bit about how you created some of those lines for yourself, some of the conversations you may have had, how you succeeded? I mean, success is, is all relative. You define what the success is, but if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think that when you're in that stage where your kids are younger, I think it's challenging to have perspective. And, you know, what I see being, you know, maybe five to ten years removed from that moment is that it is perfectly fine for what is a relatively short proportion of your working career to pull it back a year that for that period of time, and, and this is a very individualized decision, that is a decision that's shared by you and your partner and kind of other key people in your life. But if for five years, even 10 years, while your kids are in school, if you want to be in you know, gear three or four as opposed to gear five, the overall impact on your career is relatively small. And, and that not every opportunity and kind of that pedal to the metal uh, idea is necessary at every stage in your career. I mean, you know as well as I do, those kids are going to be grown up in a heartbeat. And then you will have time in your career to explore some other opportunities, say yes to more things. And so I think... Some advice I got and the advice I try to give to some of our more junior faculty in our center is when your kids are young, it, it's okay to pass on some things. This is not going to be a fatal mistake in your career. Now, if it is that one amazing opportunity, then yeah, maybe you can't pass on it. But I think being selective and and understanding that it is okay to say no to things during what is this relatively short period of your working life. And you're a great example of that. I mean, look, you know, we just talked about all the, you know, you're, you're out there presenting in Japan and Sweden and Germany and having all the success. And it was okay to, to be in gear three or gear four so that you could spend time and go to those soccer games or those track meets or things like that. Exactly. So to, you, you talked a little bit discussing with the junior faculty. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So you're seeing a new stage of women coming through the workplace, through academia. And if you had to give guidance to those in their call it late 20s, early 30s, um, what type of guidance would you give? As I, I mean, what you talked about in work balance was great, but talking about a little bit about where the industry is going, where academia is going, and guidance that you've been giving? So I think that for folks at that stage in their career, I tend to get them to try to focus, again, on what they're passionate about. Because I think that's such 
a critical key to success and, and happiness. Um, and those two things are, you know, often very closely intertwined. And so trying to get folks to focus on what they want to do and what they're excited about and less focused on what they think they're expected to do. You know, I think one, and, and maybe this is the same in the business world and my, my only experience is in academics, there's a lot of kind of unstated expectations or bars you're supposed to leap over and, and just challenging some of those unstated expectations I think is it's hard to do when you're early in your career and you're trying to you know figure out who you are and, and get your name out there but finding things that you're good at passionate at and figuring out how that fits in the mission of the organization you work with you know we do a lot of strategic planning both within our center and then even within the hospital and those words are meaningful and so figuring out how what your passion is how that fits within the mission and values of the organization you work with and if it doesn't advocating for it to be part of it i think are key things that that folks can do to ensure that they'll they'll be happy and have some success in their career some good advice. So let's bring it back to today or forward to today. And what are some of the things that you're most passionate about today? I would say that, um, as I mentioned earlier, so much of my research time and, and really outreach and advocacy time is, is in the world of concussion. And I, I'm very passionate about that field. I mean, you can't turn on ESPN or, you know, open a newspaper these days and not see some information or debate on, on the risk of concussion for our youth. And I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, obviously, as a director of an injury prevention organization, I want to mitigate the, the burden of injury on kids. But I, I'm concerned that as a society, we're swinging the other way. You know, if we think of the thing, other things that our hospital is, feels passionate about, which is obesity in, in young kids, preventing diabetes, all these other things, being physically active, uh, involved in sports are, are great therapies for those, those other great. things we're trying to huh. prevent. I never thought of it and, that way. And having had two children who both played sports, I see what they've gained kind of in their, their personality makeup from that, in addition to the health benefits, you know, leadership and teamwork and, and focus. And all those things are exactly what we want our children to experience. So I'm really in a space right now of, I don't want us to remove kids from sports and physical activity, but rather to understand how we can make those activities safer. We want kids to still participate, but we don't want to do that in the context of risk of their you know, future brain health. So I know we talked a little bit about Minds Matter. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the Minds Matter program is really our concussion program here at the hospital, and, and that it got started with that internal funding opportunity I spoke of earlier. It allowed us to standardize and, and really um, consolidate concussion care within the hospital network. One of the unique things about concussion is that um, folks show up at very different places. They, some might go to the emergency department, some might go to their pediatrician, some might go to sports medicine. And so we wanted to make sure that wherever they entered the CHOP healthcare network, they were receiving the same high quality kind of state-of-the-art pediatric concussion care. And so that funding allowed us to establish that 
through some extensive training of our pediatricians. We developed um, a, a really great website with information for parents, professionals, coaches, uh, and families. And then that has really just served as a springboard for a variety of research and outreach activities to kind of get that message across. What do we know about kids with concussion? The, the scientific foundation is pretty lacking, and, and we think we at CHOP have a unique ability to contribute to that. And then adding some facts to the discussion. I, I joke that concussion is, is probably the only medical condition where people get their information from ESPN. Um, you know, you should, you should be taking medical advice uh, from a sports program. But we, we, we just need to add facts to the discussion. And so that's really um, in collaboration with orth- orthopedics and sports medicine and my colleague, Tina Master. We, we kind of run the Minds Matter program that is both clinical research and outreach and advocacy to advance our knowledge of pediatric concussion. Well, it's very meaningful. I, I, I know you're very passionate about it and appreciate uh, everything you're doing there. Thank you. Well, Christy, this has been great. I want to thank you for all your time. I want to thank you for all the guidance you gave. I want to thank you for just sharing. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for uh, having me, and it's always a nice opportunity to kind of reflect on where you've been and where you want to go. It's great. On behalf of Progressive Women's Leadership, I'm signing off and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for listening to the podcast. For more information like this, please go to progressivewomensleadership.com. Thank you.